It's wonderful. Yeah. So I drive about 45 minutes to Sea Caucus, and then I just take the bus, and it takes half an hour, and I'm here. Oh, wow, that's, that's great. So better. it's better, and there's no stress. Yeah. Yeah. I am just not... Hi everyone, I'm Deirdre Breckenridge, CEO of Pure Performance Communications. Welcome to the NASDAQ PR Influencer Series. We're live at Market Site in Times Square, and our topic today is understanding the media mix. It's a hot topic. It's paid, earned, shared, and owned media. And we have a panel of experts joining me in the studio are Mike Schaefer. He's Senior Vice President of Digital Corporate Reputation at Edelman. Winnie Sun, founding partner of Sun Group Wealth Partners, and Brian Honigman, CEO of Honigman Media. Thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. It's great to have you in the studio. So, before we start, uh, just to let everybody know, if you have questions for the panel, I uh, have my phone right here and I'm going to leave it on the table. Our producer will be texting so that we can have some audience interaction. and. Before we start diving into our topic, maybe the three of you can just introduce yourselves because you have a list of accomplishments and I'd be reading pages. So Brian, how about you start? Thanks again for having me. Um, so I'm Brian Honigman. I'm the CEO of Honigman Media, which is a marketing consulting company uh, based in Philadelphia. Uh, basically help companies of all sizes uh, cut through the noise and tell their story more effectively and, and help them better prioritize where they should be spending their time. Um, and I also uh, write for Forbes on a regular basis and teach at NYU at the School of Professional Studies with you, um, <laughs> talking about uh, marketing and communication. So just a big marketing nerd. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> How about you, Winnie? Uh, thank you so much for having me also, Deirdre. I really appreciate being here. So I am Winnie Sun, uh, and I'm managing partner of Sun Group World Partners. I am the geek on the panel. I am a financial advisor. Um, by trade, I've been a financial advisor for about 17 years now. Uh, social media is my heart, and uh, I do also contribute for Forbes and have done so for about five years. Excellent. And Mike? Great. Thank you so much for, for having me on this esteemed panel. So my name is Mike Schaefer. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President of Digital Corporate Reputation at Edelman. We're a global public, uh, public relations and communications marketing firm. And in my role, I oversee really that intersection of digital communications and corporate storytelling, whether it be from executives, uh, employee engagement, or even talent acquisition. My career started before the internet was created. Uh, so I really look at these digital and corporate, it, look at this intersection from uh, a lens of media and publicity and events as well. Well, we certainly have the right people <laughs> in the studio today. Okay, media, always so much. Um, Everything is new. And when it comes to paid, earned, shared, and owned, for public relations professionals, this is not um, a new concept, not necessarily new practices, because we're experiencing the convergence, right, the, the integration of media. And we know that we have to subscribe to this peso model. So let's just start off, uh, maybe going around, what does peso mean to you <laughs> so sure uh, I look at it as a reminder as to where we should be focusing as marketing communication and PR pro professionals because we want to make really smart strategic decisions with our limited time and budget and peso like keeps helps uh, myself and uh, the clients that I work with keep their different business priorities top of mind so that uh, every action they're taking every campaign that they're launching uh, it's reaching people in a few different ways and you're getting the most longevity from the effort you're putting in. So that's how I, a reminder to say, 
Uh, am I reaching customers? Are they creating content on my behalf? Am I working with influencers? Are we creating valuable content? How do we use our budget? So that's a, a reminder of, uh, of how to uh, really focus uh, strategy as communicators. Yeah, I like that strategy. <laughs> how about you, Winnie? And I would agree with Brian. I think that like, I am more so on the, on the brand side. Like, I am work doing social media marketing for my company and, and to reach more clients. And I think in today's day where businesses need to differentiate from all the competition is something that's always top of mind. How can we reach more people, tell our story, and connect in a way that produces meaningful relationships? So there's the old saying, right, that if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And to me, the peso construct allows us to have a whole suite of tools at our disposal to really focus on getting the, the messages from our clients to their publics. Uh, so really uh, not looking at just one solution to problems anymore. Yeah, exactly. When I think of peso, um, it also, it reminds me that for public relations professionals, that we have so much opportunity and our roles have expanded, our, our roles and responsibilities. And being on top of the media trends and using different media and be able, being able to measure and make recommendations, we get a seat at the table. And I also just want to give a quick shout out <laughs> um, to Ginny Dietrich and Spin Sucks. I don't, I don't know if you know her peso framework, but Very it's well. really helpful helpful. I use it in the classroom, so for all of your friends and followers, it kind of breaks down that landscape. Okay, so with media, now there's always challenges, um, a little challenge called resources, right? What do you do with, you have so much media, and there's only, always so much more you could be doing. How do you prioritize? Uh, so maybe we could start with big agency side, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> How are you prioritizing the media. Well, I think what we do uh, at Edelman, I'm sure other agencies are looking at this very similar, similarly, is taking an audience-centric approach of really starting with who are the people that we want to impact, what are the conversions we want them to take, and what are the tools in our toolbox, going back to that, that idiom, that can help us get there. So we prioritize by what's going to help us achieve the goal most effectively and most efficiently, knowing that client resources are scarce. Uh, so uh, we may have three different projects that, uh, that may look similar, but uh, we're focusing on earned on one, paid on another, uh, shared on, on, on the third. So really, it, it comes down to that audience. Where are they? Where can we find them? How can we reach them? Yeah. And then, Winnie, I'm gonna, I'll hold off on you because you're your own entity. Maybe because, Brian, you're a consultant and you're working with different clients. Are similar ways that you're looking at what Mike just said or yeah. some uh, different challenges? Different challenges since uh, you know, I'm a one-man show, not a, not a big agency, so uh, a lot of the companies I work with were hyper-focused on making the most impact with the smaller budget, with less resources. And when I'm thinking about prioritizing, I'm consistently saying to myself, okay, so if we're creating a white paper, for example, how can this uh, you know, boost our efforts from a PR perspective, but also serve help us with SEO, right? How can, so on that owned, owned media, on SEO on our own site, how can uh, we involve influencers with this as opposed to just, you know, launching white papers, so all serving different, different needs, mm -hmm. when, again, focusing on longevity, right? Trying to uh, hit as, be strategic with our decision making and our planning from the beginning with, whether it's content like a white paper or a larger campaign, really thinking about, okay, how can we, uh, you know, produce a couple pieces of content that, uh, s s you know, serves different business value for us as an organization or for, uh, for a client's organization. Um, I also uh, tend to really stress as well that when, you know, a communications professional is, is, is acting in that way, right, trying to get the most value from each campaign or piece of content and growing the business and moving it forward, that it's also helpful for them as a professional to help them you know, remain valuable in the workforce, right? Like they are more of an asset at their company, more likely sure. to get a promotion when they're, they have the ability to turn their content and campaigns into like a paid asset uh, to, to, to boost it with, with AdWords or whatever it may be to, you know, partner with influencers on it. So I like to, to, to really push that as like, how can this help you also 
show your skills. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Winnie, challenges? <laughs> With a small team? Challenges. Certainly, yes, we are a small team, mighty team of 12, but we also run a very big wealth management practice. And so um, for us, it was very important to really tell our story because I do think, especially in the financial industry, the story was being told about us. And we wanted to make sure that our clients, uh, what our clients knew about us was what we were reflecting to the general public so we could continue to grow, continue to get market share, and really be a thought leader in the financial industry. So really, uh, marketing was that way. We are laser focused on who our ideal audience is, but we're also very focused on in meeting the media and other people that can help us tell our story. Definitely. So. When you're telling your story, and, and there are so many channels, um, what are some of the new and innovative ways that you're doing it? So for, for example, I was interviewing somebody recently, and they were saying that a lot of their um, videos that they're doing, digital videos, they're putting on Facebook Watch. And I was thinking to myself, hmm, now that's not Facebook Live. Facebook Watch is different, so I texted my millennial at home, <laughs> and I said, Facebook Watch, and she said, oh yeah, it's Facebook's new video site, and it's like YouTube on Facebook. So there's always something new, right? We, we have to keep our eyes open. What does that look like for you? Mike, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think there, there's inherent risk, that there's so many new channels, and our clients, especially on the agency consulting side, even in private business, are really trying to make the best of the resources that we have. And how often can you roll the dice? And uh, you know, it, it's that combination of art and science of making sure that you know where the audience is and you're reaching them uh, with the right creative message that will get them to go further down that, that funnel, whether it's awareness or closer to a conversion. So it's a challenge then to say, hey, there's this new thing that we have no data on, we don't know who's on there, but let's invest valuable resources to go on there. On the consumer side, I think it may be a little bit easier than on the corporate side. Uh, yes. And it, it takes, I think, um, the right brands to really want to be innovators in, in that space. And I, uh, kudos to them. I don't know if I would have the, uh, uh, the wherewithal to, to make those same decisions. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment? Yeah. I I, I'm all for experimenting and, and innovating on new places, and I think uh, when consumers and our competitors are moving to new channels, we have to keep up, keep up with it. But I, at oftentimes, I think there's too much of a focus on being on the latest and greatest new shiny channel, um, when instead you can take a step back and test really strategically and say, okay, so we're already creating a YouTube series, let's say, for our organization. How can we pull those existing assets and repurpose them so that they work on Facebook Watch, or they we can, uh, you know, share a short trailer of it of the series on Instagram, instead of reinventing the wheel every time, so that you're still taking a risk, but it's a safer bet, right? You're not set, spreading yourself too thin, trying to be everywhere on 40 different channels instead of, you know, let's just say 10 channels in a more meaningful way. So. Um, all about like taking smart risks when you're trying to test out new channels. So I, I was stressed to, to, to think about it before diving in because it is exciting, right? Yes. It's like, oh wow, Facebook Watch, it's like maybe the new TV in some sense. Like, let's see how that, we want to be there. But you have to kind of gut check sometimes and say, does that make sense? And how can we make this experiment really work for us in the long term? Yeah, I agree. The, the pilot program always makes, when, when I own my agency, clients would feel much more comfortable with testing, uh, you know, test and learn, and then if it's successful, you move forward. So that definitely works. Yeah, I would agree completely with both, both Mike and Brian on this. I think you have to test new platforms, but every platform has its own environment and its own audience. So what works on one platform won't work on another platform. But I think the mistake would be to discount it and not try it. Because especially in, in uh, some industries like mine and medical, there are certain uh, platforms we're just not allowed to use by regulatory reasons, right? Yeah. right? But it doesn't mean by the time they allow us to use it, we had have had no experience. So we should at least test it, maybe not publicly, but get a feel of what's working, what sort of stories resonate, what kind of audience is there, and um, be really mindful that whatever platforms you dedicate to, to being on, to really be focused on doing the best that you can. 
and, and not just producing content for the sake of content, but being laser focused, like what is it your audience expects from you and what do they love receiving from you and hone that craft. That is a great point. What, what do they expect? Exactly. Because it's, it's all about the, your, your, your audience, the, the people who want to hear from you. Exactly. So, and the curiosity too, never should be discounted. As, as professionals, I always tell PR pros, you have to roll up your sleeves and, and be a tech tester mm -hmm. in a sense. It doesn't mean that you're going to recommend to your own company to invest millions of dollars right away, but we, we have to do that. And I think with the, the advent of new channels, you have to constantly audit the channels you're currently using Ooh, to yeah. see if you're still getting the same benefit. That sometimes it may be uh, you trade channel A for channel B if the audience is there. Uh, and I know for a lot of brands and companies, it's hard to, to let go of channels or deprioritize channels that were so critical uh, maybe even two years ago that just aren't uh, getting the same return in 2017. Yeah, that audit is so critical, and not to do a spoiler, but I'm <laughs> writing an article for the NASDAQ Market Insight blog <laughs> has to do with audit, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think at this point, I, I have a feeling that maybe the viewers watching us might be stepping back and thinking, hmm, is it that we should be diving in more deeply to a type of media, or is it more important to spread across? What do you think? If you were going to give some advice and two-part question, um, is it does it depend on the campaign? You know, product launch versus a brand building campaign. What do you think, Ryan? Sure. Uh, it certainly depends on your circumstances, what your goals are, what industry you're in, right? But I think the the short answer is you got to be somewhere in the middle, right? You don't want to put all going back to like making safe bets or super risky bets. You want to put all your investments in two or three channels that, you're, that you don't own, right? That, that uh, for the long term, may not be there, may not be servicing your organization forever in the same way that it has up until this point. Where, and that's too thin, and if any of those you know, discontinue or for some reason your, your customers move away, then you're scrambling to figure out what's next. How are we gonna grow ourselves in the next quarter or in the next half the year or whatever? Um, where at the same time, like I said before, you don't want to spread yourself so thin. You want to be on Pinterest because everyone else is on Pinterest or whatever it may be. Like I certainly am all for testing, but if you're on 40 places, even as a big brand like GE or American Express, and you're there in a haphazard way, who cares? It's just, and, and I, I think often marketers and communicators are sometimes on those channels just to show that they're active, that they're to their their boss saying, "Look, I'm doing stuff." and Right, you want to show that you're experimenting, but there has to be more purpose behind it. So instead of, you know, being on a few places and or being on too many, find that middle ground. And I don't have that number because it, it it varies. It doesn't. There isn't exactly one perfect number, but uh, you know, try let's just say ten tactics, ten channels, so that you're constantly moving in and out of these investments. Going off of what you said, some channels you'll replace with mm -hmm. brand new ones. So you're constantly like reassembling this mix of your focus of tactics in different channels. And if something fails, well that stinks, but that's okay because you have all these other efforts you, that you're, you're active on right now that you can fall back on, keep working, and that gives you more uh, flexibility and room to you know, uh, use your marketing mix, your communication mix to your advantage. Right, you're really finding the right mix. Yeah. Now, when you, you are really on Twitter. <laughs> There's a you have many many followers. So you're you're deep in in Twitter. Are there any other channels that you're deep or you go across? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I am very active on Twitter. It's it's something that I really enjoy. I love our community. But I think um, I am also active on other platforms as well. There, I definitely am definitely learning a lot on YouTube, doing Facebook, Facebook Live and LinkedIn as well, and looking at always other platforms as well. I think the, to answer your question originally, like where do we go? I think for me, it was the, the main question I would say is where are your resources? If you're, you have the ability, like a larger agency, to go into a whole bunch of platforms and more power to you. But a lot of times, you will reflect your consumer or your client, in my case, and therefore, where is it that you enjoy being on? Often, that's where your uh, tribe will be and so you want to focus and really become an expert in that space and and produce content that is shareable content that just 
it, it makes it so that you're building a brand, building a good reputation, and they don't feel like you're all over the place or they can't get you and you're just like sending information in one direction. So it has to be that interactive. So where do you feel most comfortable? Like if Snapchat isn't my strength, then I just don't spend as much effort on it. It's just, it's not something I do well. Yeah, no, good, good answer. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think um, the human element of this is really important too of what are the skills of the people that you have on your team that in the past, uh, let's just say five years, we've gone from an industry of generalists to clients that are demanding more specialization. So something like Google AdWords, I think anyone that knows how to do word processing can figure out how to do Google AdWords, but that doesn't mean that they're qualified to run really sophisticated SEM campaigns. And the expectation of our industry isn't what it was five, 10 years ago to have that level of sophistication. The analogy that, that I like to use on that is, my kids have all 64 colors of Crayola crowns, but that doesn't make their art museum worthy, right? So sometimes it's barely, it for, sometimes it's barely refrigerator worthy, uh, but making sure that you have the people that are trained in these, that you can get uh, in, you can swirl a lot, especially in, in paid. If someone doesn't know how to do earned, they can really uh, damage reputation for a company, an agency, a brand, for other people. Uh, and, and own content, gosh, how many stories have we heard from brands that the wrong content got, got tweeted from an account? Uh, so really making sure that you have people that are properly trained. A lot of these things used to be done by like the social media guy at an agency. I, I was that person early <laughs> in my career. Uh, but now there's whole teams of people that need to go really deep in those specializations. And it, it may not be that every client organization needs a team of 20 ninjas, right? Uh, but some do, uh, and some that's internally or with, with external partners to really have that deep specialization to achieve their goals. So I want to stay on this because you pointed out the, the skills and deepening your skills. When, you, um, when you're a, an agency, like mm -hmm. you have, clients are coming to you, do you notice that there are certain services? When is it time to say, hey, you know, we need you to do our paid media placements or you're going to focus on earn? What stays in-house and what kind of comes over to the agency? I think it's different for every situation. We have clients that have 30-person in-house comms teams. We have clients that have one person plus half of an IT guy's time. Uh, so we have this broad spectrum. Uh, and organizations prioritize different elements in-house and the way that it's organized. That I mean, who owns social media at a large enterprise? I think you ask every Fortune 500 company, you'll get 600 different answers. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's no standardization in what clients want to do in-house uh, versus ship out. Uh, uh, what I am seeing more and more is the technical stuff, the nitty gritty, like going deep into to SEM. Uh, that's something that they're willing to, uh, to ship off to a partner that can invest in that expertise. Uh, website building and app building, that I'm seeing more and more go to the agencies than being kept in-house. Right, and Brian, do you see that as a consultant? Yeah, uh, same as Mike, uh, short answer is there's no standard, right? But the way I like to think of it is, even as a consultant, when I rely on, on helping different companies ex uh, excel with marketing, I don't want uh, any organization to be solely reliant on having too many agencies or consultants. Like I want them to have some level of expertise on how to execute what they're doing on their own because they are the brand advocates, they know what they're doing um, and how the organization uh, should be positioned best, right? Um, but what I think makes the most sense, going off of what Mike said earlier too, when it's that technical kind of monotonous stuff, I feel like that's the most often when they work with outside partners because it's just not a good use of their time. And I think uh, that's that's the the what I tell clients when they're thinking to, to decide to work with me or they, they maybe need a larger agency, I say, what, what kind of timeline are you working on? Because I can help execute whatever campaign, because I have the expertise in this area to have it completed in a much timelier fashion, right? Whereas there's a learning curve. If I were to train an organization on how to do it themselves, it depends on their goals. But if, if uh, saving time is a you know, top concern, then definitely like an outside partner makes sense. Because yeah. um, they have the expertise in that area just to, to move more quickly 
in, in many cases. But it, again, there's just no standard. It really makes uh, depends on what you're looking to achieve and where your expertise currently lies. Right. I like that you said there's a shared responsibility. It is important for the brand to know what's going on and to embrace their media alongside of a partner. So what about from an in-house perspective at your company, Winnie? Um, when it comes to outsourcing to a partner, are there things that you're more willing to outsource? There are, there are, and there are certain things we can't outsource. I don't want to outsource, and so um, I definitely think that in terms of some of the content creation, we could have outsource, right? Video production or editing of written work and whatnot, but at least for our brand, the part that I don't want to outsource is the direct communication with our audience. I think some of that, that intimacy and those relationships are, are very near and dear. And I do think it's different when it comes from myself or someone on my team rather than someone outside who doesn't know our nuances and what we're doing that morning. You know, those things matter. And, and I think that's why we've developed such a strong social brand and something, someone that's very, they think of us, they think of something trustworthy and who's very embracing of them. No, that, that's a great point because there are things that your audience just wants from you and, and that's what makes you more intimate with them. So that is true. Let's kind of um, pivot a little bit to scale and um, application. And Winnie, I'm going to lob this one <laughs> at you. There, there's definitely no one size fits all when it comes to managing and measuring your media. So when you have a small team and a small budget, how do you kind of make that work uh, across different media, across the peso model? Will you become a superhero? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you certainly are. <laughs> well, there's no choice. But, but you I forgot your cake today. <laughs> yeah, you have your cake today, and you employ your children. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, I think you prioritize what you have to do and what you can do and what you enjoy doing. And once you focus on what it is your strengths are, and then you figure out what your team members can help support. You know, so there's always going to be a hundred things that you need to do. Um, on all sorts of things, especially when it comes to media. Um, but what is it that you have to do that will get you not only the additional audience that you're interested in, but also what will it do to for in terms of monetization, right? So not just creating content for the sake of creating content, but having a goal in mind, a purpose in mind, and really um, creating a specific, I think, you know, bite-sized bite-sized campaigns, so it's not so difficult. So having kind of a plan in place, but being flexible enough and dedicating that intrinsic time to having that communication. So one of the things that we do, as you know, is we do a very large global tweet chat yes. you know, every Wednesday. And that's great, because it's a something scheduled and that's consistent, we've done it for a few years, and people know that during that one hour, they'll get, they'll get to communicate with you directly. So just having platforms in place and scheduling in place so it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and with that scheduling, people look forward to it yes. every week. And your your Twitter chat is super well known. I think you hit millions Thank of people, you. if I'm not mistaken. I guess stop that, at Costco. <laughs> that, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, hashtag Winnie Sun. Mm -hmm, very simple. Okay, that's really easy. <laughs> Mike, you want to comment? Yeah, I think it, it really has to, when you talk about scaling, you have to make two lists of what's mission critical versus what's nice to have. And that really guides your, your uh, decision making process. Just yesterday I was uh, on the phone with a client that wanted uh, social listening uh, software or to, to ship that out to a vendor. We started talking through what they really were trying to find. And we said, yeah, this may cost you $25,000 a year just for the tool and for what you're, you're hoping to get, that's not going to be worth it. So we were able to, to say, okay, this, is, this would be a really nice to have, but budgets are limited and there may be a better, a better direction for those funds. Yeah, is that a hard conversation to have when you have to direct somebody and say, you want this, but it's really best to hold off and, and focus on, on this? How, how, are clients receptive to that? Absolutely, I, I think uh, clients want agency partners, whether it's consultants or are a mid-sized boutique or a large agency, they'll be honest with them. And if we can help them save money. I know, <laughs> that's a, I, who yes. doesn't like that? Yeah, yeah. so um, there have been a few times that I can think of over the, the past year or so 
where we've been able to talk clients out of spending money, sometimes uh, on, on programs that they were really gung-ho about, but it wouldn't help them achieve their goals the way that they wanted to. And once we were able to walk them through that, they were really excited that we had those conversations. And while we had to shift their, their mindset a little bit, um, it actually, I think, strengthened our partnerships. Okay, you guys get an A. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'm take a it. professor. <laughs> you get an A. Well, okay, so um, let's talk accountability. Because <laughs> that's such a big topic in public relations. And the more media you put towards us, the more accountability we have to have. So maybe we can just touch on how you are looking at outputs, measuring outputs across the paid, earned, shared, owned, wherever you are for your clients or maybe for yourself. So Brian, you want to start with that? Yeah, uh, it, it can seem very complicated. Measurement is like kind of untouchable feeling sometimes, especially when first talking with clients, they're like, okay, this sounds wonderful. And we've seen a lot of like, you know, very vanity success from others on this, but what, how do you actually measure this? Uh, I think the key is to understand what your overarching goal is and then simply pair metrics that make sense on that particular channel with that goal. That is the simplest way of thinking about it. So let's say your goal is awareness. From a uh, owned perspective, what kind of viewership are you getting on your blog posts? Viewership are you getting on your videos from an awareness standpoint? So on YouTube, that might be just views. And thinking about views on YouTube is different than thinking about views on Facebook, right? Where they, uh, they, they count the seconds differently with what they constitute a view. And you have to keep that in mind because it would skew uh, you know, what kind of awareness you think you're getting on one versus the other. So Do clients understand that or you're pretty much educating them? Uh, I, I feel like most of the time it's, we need to be educated on that a little bit because, you know, we're, I, f I feel like most people are trusting what you see sure. view on a video as it listed and it, you're like, okay, that's the same as, as what I've seen in the past when you have to, to dive a little bit deeper. That's why it's great to work with a partner to call out that kind of stuff. Um, what kind of awareness are your, is earned media driving you, right? And whether that's uh, customers talking about you on Instagram or, you know, a, YouTube influencer, you know, sharing a review of you. Um, you have to consistently apply the metrics that make sense for that channel, um, and it's all tied back to your goal. Keep it yeah. as simple as possible. And I like simple. <laughs> simple yeah. is good. Well, I think that's a great question. I mean, we I think about this all the time because we, to be honest, um, following metrics is not our strength. But what is the way that we um, keep ourselves accountable is how many new clients do, how much client interaction comes, how many new clients get introduced to us who found us on something that we wrote or created in terms of content. Um, and then from there, you know, um, you know, the media opportunities that we then receive all from the, the, the campaigns that or work that we're doing on social media. That's how we keep ourselves accountable. Well, I think getting new clients is a <laughs> wonderful way to show that conversion from yeah. social media all the way right to your business. That's excellent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, there's a long history of fuzziness in measuring PR, to, <laughs> to put it uh, lightly, right? That's so, putting it nicely. <laughs> yeah, so, but what I think the peso model does so well, and, and you were hitting on this, Brian, is it gets us closer to that business impact of we can really link a YouTube video, if we can link that to a new customer or whatever that, that communications or business goal may be. So we're not just um, counting stats. The stats are great, um, but if you have a billion of the wrong people view your content and nothing comes of it, was that a, a worthwhile investment? Uh, so really keeping that, that audience laser focus. And sometimes you may be trying to communicate with eight people in the world. We worked with a, a client that was trying to uh, get uh, visibility in front of some uh, decision makers. We were able to target those decision makers on LinkedIn. We saw who they were. Right. And we could we could then uh, reverse engineer how do we target them. So it, it may look like a broader campaign, but really if we have these eight people or 10 people, however many it was, that, that were impacted by that and felt favorably about that, that uh, content and then came closer to making a decision in our client's direction, that was a grand slam home run. Or yeah. would be if it that that is a so, home yeah. run. I mean, the fact that you can target to eight or ten or however many is is amazing. And I also think it comes down to setting up the right expectations. So, Brian, you spoke about the goals, and sometimes 
teams often set how we're going to roll out with programs and what the benchmarks are going to be. But if you have an executive team that's expecting something completely different, right. like maybe what's coming in on the business side, that disconnect is always a, a very tough conversation. Okay, well, I'm glad you're all up on the accountability. When it comes to measuring, are you noticing any channels that are standing out really, really performing well? And I know it's a tough question mm -hmm. because, Mike, you have so many different clients, but yeah. have you had a lot of success in any particular channels? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, we've seen success in, in every channel based on what the assignment is, who the client is, sometimes who, who the human being that we're partnering with is. Um, from my work that is really on the corporate comm side, LinkedIn is, is really the gold standard in that, that communications from executives, from an organization. Facebook has really uh, enhanced their influencers platform over the last two years. We've done a lot of work with that team. And that's something where if you go back in time three or four years and say, oh, we'll have the CEO uh, be on, on Facebook, uh, you'd be laughed out of the water. Um, so uh, now th that's a whole paradigm shift. Um, you know, uh, channels are, are wide ranging and I, I don't think I can say that there's one channel that's great, ones that aren't, because I look at, at Twitter as one that, that we've struggled with in corporate comms, but Winnie does such an amazing job <laughs> in, in doing that. And, and for her business and, and her brands, it's, it's a huge hit and, and a huge part of, of what she does. So I, I think the channels are, are amazing tools when you use them appropriately. Definitely. So Winnie, on, on that note, <laughs> the, the Twitter note, is that the channel that you're seeing is best performing or are there others that you're seeing just as well good results? This is probably going to surprise you, but um, for me it's been mostly Facebook Live and LinkedIn. Facebook speak. Although I have a lot less followers on Facebook, but the whole live platform has been very powerful for what I do. And uh, LinkedIn is has like exactly I, I would agree it's a gold standard. I, I've signed many many clients from LinkedIn. Twitter has been wonderful in terms of getting reach, but certainly like like it would, people always ask me which platform is your favorite? And I said, well, that's like choosing between my children. I love them all <laughs> differently. You know, they're all amazing. I wouldn't trade a single one for, for the other. But I think it, it just depends. Every, every platform is slightly different, but you gotta understand the culture and the, the audience within each one. And each one is, for me, very profitable. Yeah, and, and Brian? Yeah, it certainly depends uh, for clients, right? It depends on the industry and what they're trying to achieve, just like Mike and Winnie were saying. It, you can't, it's hard to choose one, right? For beauty, uh, often brands see success. Clients that I've worked with see success on Instagram and YouTube, working with influencers there, and B2B, Facebook, and LinkedIn are pretty uh, useful for you know, building thought leadership around you know, the C-suite. Um, but for, for me, uh, for marketing my business, I, the, the main... Uh, success I found is through writing, through blogging on a consistent basis and letting people know kind of uh, where my expertise lies, where my ideas come from, what, what I think my perspective on a particular issue and over time that's ranked in, in uh, search for different marketing related searches that's helped uh, you know fuel my social channels I can say hey here's a new article about this topic and have a little mini conversation about it on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn and then they can dive more deeply and get to know me and that's how what's led to you know building my business from the start really it was more so on the side uh, as a marketer at a couple of different companies writing about this stuff because I love it mm -hmm. it's interesting it's to passion. talk about I'm a, I'm a huge nerd but it, there was also you know major business value and again putting your expertise out there so that when an organization is deciding between you and another, another vendor, you know, what do you offer that's different, right? You can say that you're great all day, right? Who cares? But if you can show what you actually know, that makes all the difference. So that's how I kind of think about uh, marketing channels for myself and my business. But again, it just really depends on um, what industry you operate in and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you talked about blogging because I feel the same way. I've, I've been so blogging great. since 2007. And I don't want to give it up. It's, it's a wonderful way to get your 
thoughts and share your ideas and also start conversations on different Ooh, channels. More deeply too, right? Yes, like, it's I, like deep reporting. Yeah, I more <laughs> you know, tend to like, okay, let's have a short conversation on Facebook or LinkedIn sure. about a professional subject, but it's nice to have that mix, right, where you're going in depth on something, whether that's a video or an infographic or an article. Uh, it just uh, adds another kind of layer to the conversation. Yeah, it definitely does. So, speaking of the conversation, um, how much are your customers um, or your clients' customers informing decisions around media? So, in other words, we're, we're clearly measuring outputs, we're looking at a lot of data, it's quantitative, but what about the qualitative, the feelings, the what's everybody thinking? How, how much is that a part of your world? You know, I mentioned earlier the uh, dichotomy between the art and the science, and I think in the overall communications and marketing sphere, uh, art used to rank much higher. And now science is sort of inching up and to the point where you can say they're almost even right now, and some people may put the science ahead of the art. Um, so I, I think a uh, a well-written brief for creative uh, would be steeped in, in the science and the research and the data and those insights. And then you take your creative team or your content team and you layer those messages that map back to, to what uh, the insights tell you. So then at the end of the day, the, the audience, the customers, the, the end users of products are the ones that are making every single decision for us. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And Winnie, do you feel that way too? Yes, this, listening. <laughs> absolutely. This is a big part, a hallmark guy of our work in terms of social media marketing. Almost so much is driven from our clients or audience telling us what they want to hear from us. For example, you know, the recent Equifax news that came out, and I literally had probably 10 clients say, Winnie, you have to put together a video on what to do because of this news, and you know, it'd be great for you to create this content. So they are becoming my focus group. They're sharing and teaching me, and so that's why I love actually handling a lot of the social media interactions all by myself, because um, that's the only way I can really pick up on the feelings of what would, be, what would resonate with them, so. Oh, that's really good, and you're so much closer mm -hmm. to them that way. Right? Yeah, I, I agree. Building off of what you're saying, you're getting direct feedback from your, the people you're trying to serve, right? You're trying to do business with, saying, we want to know about these subjects or this is a concern of mine. And you have the ability to ignore it or address it um, and be, be there listening. And these channels only make it easier to, to get informed about uh, how your which direction your messaging should take. Like you should, as an organization, should you know, set the tone and then let uh, help if you have a collaborative conversation with your customers and they can help direct it in, in different directions. And just paying attention to where consumers, your, your customers, um, in some cases consumers, uh, are spending time, because that shifts and it's stressful like, to keep up with yes. what, what's the newest channel. And that's why I try to like, get the whole channel conversation, calm that down because everyone's just trying to be on the latest and greatest. And what's important is just really paying attention to where your audience whoever that may be, is spending time uh, online and offline um, and having meaningful interactions and how can your organization chime in there in a relevant way that adds value, not just saying, buy my stuff, but instead be like, okay, uh, you know, you're scared about security breaches and from a financial perspective, here's how, to, how we're protecting you and here's how some things you can do, right, to empower them uh, and make them feel good and make them uh, feel part of the process because they are, you're, they're informing uh, you know, the ideas you're putting out into the world, the messaging, and uh, you know, making sure that you're serving their needs. That's a great point, making your customers a part of your brand, your process. It just gets them closer to you. So I guess because, I mean, I, I'm thinking way back in, in the day, uh, we were building relationships in, in different ways, and it feels like through this peso model, um, we're now building relationships through different types of media, and we're asking people to trust us. So do you feel like you're able to build real trusting relationships, like back in the day when, I know, I was meeting with uh, reporters and having a cup of coffee or <laughs> having lunch? So what does it mean, building trust and relationships online? 
I, I would say consistency and, and follow through with what you're saying. So consistency and authenticity with what you're, you're putting out there into the world. As a, as a gay business owner, I'm constantly looking at how brands are addressing the LGBTQ consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a consumer, I'm, I'm buying from organizations kind of based on how they inform me directly or indirectly of where they stand. So going on the consistency and authenticity, so it's wonderful to uh, announce through your ad campaigns or including in your, your customers that you're featuring, you know, queer families or queer couples or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and, and calling out that you support these causes, right? That, that makes you feel good, and, and I can understand you're trying to build trust with that particular demographic that's you know, finally getting more, more attention. Um, but if you don't you know, internally as an organization support you know, spousal benefits for your employees or you're not taking any action on the, what you're, you're talking about, right? Uh, that, that's where like, the trust is lost, right? The authenticity isn't really there, and if you're doing it on a one-off basis, the, the consistent, it's not really an important issue, it just kind of feels like pandering. It feels like you're trying to jump on the most recent trend as opposed to, this is a, a set of values that your, your organization is really um, focusing on, that really matter to you in a meaningful way, that connect to your purpose. So, uh, you know, LGBT, LGBTQ consumers or otherwise, just consistently putting out the right messaging uh, on the, the values that you, you're passionate about and that means something to your organization is one way to build trust than being authentic, right? Uh, acting is far more beneficial than just saying, you know, you uh -huh. care about a certain thing. So finding that balance is, yeah. is really important. And not as many organizations have found that balance, more just saying, we support you and want your money, right? As opposed to, we've taken action to, to help, you know, broaden the horizons of both our customers and employees. So something to, to think about for sure. Yeah, action always speaks louder than words. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. How about you, Winnie? This is something I am so glad you asked the question on because I'm so passionate about this. I think um, media, PR, social media, really I, I equate it to a lot like alcohol. If you're a nice person, social media is just, you're gonna be a nicer person. If you're not nice, it'll come out in social media as well. So it's a time saver. It really amplifies who I should be spending time getting to know, building the relationship with the right people. It it also helps me give a platform to really publicly thank or support or love you know, online and, and help them reach their goals. So I think it, it's a better leverage of time. I can have more relationships. I was able to connect with you. And, um, and I probably wouldn't have had that opportunity if I, I have to give a big shout out, thank you to Twitter for that. But <laughs> there's, yeah, there's just, so I am absolutely just so thankful that we have all these platforms because I have so many more meaningful, deep relationships. So that by the time I sit with you today, I feel like we've been together in the same room for years. I know, yeah. it's so true. And I'm thankful for Twitter that <laughs> I met you too. How about you, Mike? Yeah, so, uh, Edelman has spent a lot of uh, time uh, studying trust over the last two decades. And one of the trends that we've been following is building off what, what Brian was saying, that, that consumers more and more want, to, want brands to live their ethos and to stand for something. And that, that people are making their decisions with their, their money and their time based on do they align with the values of an organization. So I think there, there's a lot to that. Uh, we even see that from executives, that people want, want to hear those values come straight from the C-suite, not just from brand TV spots. Well, I think you're all so wonderful, the way that you're building relationships and, and your perspectives. Uh, just let's do a real quick lightning round. If you can give advice to other professionals, kind of as our takeaway, about how to really create impact um, across a mix of media, go. How would you do that? <laughs> uh, be very clear on your core purpose as an organization or as a professional in, in this space and understand what, what do you want from all this? What try, what, who are you trying to serve? What do you want? Uh, what do you um, want to be remembered for in your work? Whether that's on one campaign, like what, what emotions are you trying to invoke? And on the big scale, what should your career uh, say about you as a person, right? That, again, going back to authenticity, authenticity and uh, how are you consistently, you know, positioning yourself in the right way. And that, again, small scale and on, on a large scale. 
good. Winning. I love that. <laughs> I love that yeah. too. That's nice. My thing would be I build up on that. I would say don't think too much about it and just go and do it. Don't repurpose other people's content. Open yourself up. Be human. People like to do business with other humans. Tell them when you're not having a good day. Tell them what you're eating. Share the things that will resonate and people will relate to. Awesome. Earn centric social by design. Make campaigns that will earn people's attention, whether it's through any of the the media platforms that, that are out there and make them so awesome that people would want to share them, not just on social, but while they're standing in line at the coffee shop too. Terrific. One last question. Where can everyone find out more about you and your company? Uh, I'm at Mike Schaefer on Twitter and you can look me up on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Winnie. Uh, my name is Winnie, like Winnie the Pooh, sun, like sun in the sky. And I have a website, winniesun.com, and the company site is sungroupwp.com. Awesome. Brian? Uh, BrianHoneyman.com is one of the best places to find out more inf information on me as well as my newsletter which I send out bi-weekly at just BrianHoneyman.com slash newsletter and that's the best way to stay in touch and learn how to approach marketing and communications in a hype free way. Excellent. Thank you all so much for coming in today. I know you've traveled from California, Washington, Philadelphia. We really appreciate all of your insights and advice. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to the NASDAQ PR Influencer Series. I'm Deirdre Breckenridge signing off for now, but stay tuned for more from NASDAQ.